partner around the Asia Pacific for Additive. Additive is a digital wealth, digital finance company offering a lot of products and platforms uh, in the cloud, originally out of Switzerland, uh, also with a sizable Asia operation. I want to start with a question or a quiz because this is for you as much as it is for me. What do you guess by how much the household incomes in Southeast Asia will increase between last year, 2017 and 2013? Percentage numbers, what do you think? Francis, come on. 20, any other numbers? 30%, daring, 30%. It's nearly 100%. The household incomes of key economies in Southeast Asia will double in the next 12 years. What does that mean? Why is this relevant? Arguably, a lot of that will go into consumption. But then, quite a bit might be left over at the end of the month for saving, for investing, for creating a financial future for these people and their children. And, the, and this is a phenomenon it's called emerging affluence. You've all heard about it. And there is probably only about 100 million emerging affluence in Southeast Asia. That's an amazing number. So 100 million people and families who have money left over at the end of the month and they don't know what to do with it. They're not going to put it in a turn deposit. They're not going to put it in a bank account. Their parents got burned in the financial crisis. They're not going to just invest it in, in the stock markets. Where do they go? So the issue I want to deal with, and I want to address is how to engage them from a financial services perspective as a financial institution, and as you'll see in the course of the presentation, also perhaps as a non-financial institution that already has some means to engage them today through apps. So how do you engage them sustainably and quickly? Because the way financial institutions go about wealth management today is, as I'll also argue in the following, not sustainable. It's financially not sustainable. And it's certainly not quick the way they do it. Good. Let's talk about engagement. Financial services as a topic is not engaging by nature. It's boring. People don't want to hear about it. It's unpleasant. It's full of jargon. It's no, there's no reward. There's no gratification. Online e-commerce is. There's instant gratification, or at least next day, if you get your stuff delivered. Financial services is not. It's paying bills and doing stuff like that. So it's not engaging by nature. So it's something uh, that has to be overcome. So let's unpack the topic of engagement. There's certainly stuff in life that's highly irrelevant. And it, it is also, uh, it also features a pretty dull user interface. And an example are the user instructions of your vacuum cleaner. Who has read the user instructions of their vacuum cleaners in the last three months? Okay, I seem to be the only, the only geek here. So it's not particularly engaging and certainly not relevant for your lives. Now, let's add something. Let's add the Roomba and the little remote control, and I think these days they probably have apps, um, as something that is a lot more engaging. And people actually spend hours watching their little Roombas uh, explore their, their apartments. But still, it's irrelevant. It doesn't make any impact on your life, let alone your financial future. So let's look at the more relevant things. Tax return. It's highly relevant. And in certain countries, fortunately not in, not in Singapore, uh, it can actually be quite expensive. So it's very relevant for you, but dull. It's false to be filled out. If you're lucky, you can do it electronically, but still most of the tax returns in this world are filled out on paper. Unfortunately, this is how many financial institutions look at the issue of engagement. They take, they put their forms online. 
and you get long questions, two-point font, websites, not, for, not, 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 uh, not apps, nothing that looks like a revolut. So this is not engaging. So the, uh, the issue is still wealth management, people are financially illiterate, short attention span, digital lifestyle, how do you engage them? I think one way is, uh, is theme-based investing. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on that. But I think the, uh, uh, taking out the jargon, making this interesting, exciting, talking about themes, travel to Mars, fight against sugar, cats and dogs, whatever. It's a lot more interesting and can actually be used for wealth management and for engaging pe people and for getting them to invest. Let me just play a one minute video of what that looks like. No matter whether driverless cars, the trend towards e-health, interesting regions like the Indian subcontinent, or the green yield as a sustainable addition to your portfolio, Wertstein makes the trends of the times, the so-called zeitgeists, investable for you with just one click. Look, I mean, I read in the, the Wall Street Journal or whatever, Wirtschaftswoche, a really interesting article about driverless cars or batteries, but I can't invest. And it's even the same if I go on the internet, I look on my tablet. Again, I'm just frustrated. I read that article, but then I can't put my money into it. But with Wertstein, I read the article, I watch the video, and at the end, I just press the button and I can invest. So, Wertstein is a uh is a venture, is an independent venture, active in Europe and now in Asia, as well as powered by Additive, by uh, our company's uh, software. And it's purely theme-based, together with, with uh, uh, proper risk management, onboarding and compliance and all the likes. So that's the engagement topic. Now, interestingly, uh, to keep, keep the thought of the emerging affluence, the 100 million emerging affluence in mind. In these countries, be it Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Vietnam. Lots of companies exist that already have mobile assets, i.e. apps, that people look at every day, i.e. eyeballs. So, if you want to engage people or want to do something interesting and you want to address these highly mobile, highly digital uh, emerging affluence, you use an existing asset. That could be a bank, that could be a retail app, of which there are many around. This could be a retailing e-commerce app, a lot more interesting and a lot more engaging. So it could be a retailer. It could also be a telco, because although telco's apps tend to be kind of tedious and boring, you still need to look at them want to see your usage, maybe want to top up, want to buy a roaming package, want to do stuff. So there is also built-in engagement and there are eyeballs. So there are existing assets that networked companies already have and they can be used because what you can do is you can add a robo-advisor, a wealth management asset, something like Wirtstein, which we just saw, something interesting, you can add it to this mobile asset and you can do it in a somewhat archaic way and just put a, a menu item on and call it wealth or robo advisor or save money or ensure the future of your children or whatever uh, or you can use an advanced analytics because you know these people you know your customers you know their patterns you know their behaviors and so you can use that information to pre-populate things such as you have two teenage kids that will be interested in university education in six years time in Singapore that costs you XYZ dollars you better start saving now we know you can put $173 aside every month and you have $5,000 in the kitty already this is what happens if you if you save or invest this in a robo-like uh, facility, whatever's behind it doesn't matter, but you can engage people based on their lifestyle, based on the understanding, the data, the analytics, and the eyeballs 
directly and lead them into digital wealth. This is very important. This is the main lever for doing that. Now, we talked about engagement. What about sustainability? Sustainability is financial sustainability. This is about IT, developing IT, developing IT in financial services, involving banks, often banks, not necessarily. But if an, a major bank sees the word IT project, the first million dollars has just gone out the door because they think in 10, 100 million dollar orders of magnitude. So how is that going to work? We're ultimately talking about wealth, digital wealth. Let's look at some of the economics. What has happened in the wealth industry is that the economics have actually gone south. Although this is pointing up, but the only thing that's pointing up is the cost income ratio. So if you're not familiar with that term, today an average wealth manager who makes one dollar of revenue, fees or whatever comes in, pays 77 cents for doing business cost of doing business, IT, people, facilities, penalties, all kinds of stuff. That's not sustainable and it has increased over the last few years and so far it's pointing up. It keeps pointing up. So now that's the cost side. Let's look at the fees. There's a problem with fees. It, so far more in trading, not necessarily in wealth management yet, but that's probably going to come. The trajectory of fee volumes and percentages is actually pointing to zero. It's approaching zero. And you're probably aware Robin Hood is offering stock trading for zero commissions. Revolut just announced securities trading for zero commissions. So you've got to think very hard how your wealth management service, ultimately an advisory service or an investment service, is going to be valued in the world where people take stuff for granted, assume and expect it to be free. Well, that's not looking very good. Who, whose fault is this, by the way? I mean, this is a bro broader, broader fintech problem. James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, invented automation. So, this is all. The Revolut operations and the Robin Hood operations, they're lights out operations. There's very, very few people involved, a couple, except a couple on the chat line. The other guy is, of course, Tim Berners Lee, uh, who showed us the power of networking and hyper networking and what that means and hyperscaling. So these are the effects that are happening out there in the internet, in our world, that financial institutions have not been able to follow economically. So we have an economic problem realizing digital wealth services for digital natives for emerging affluence in a financially sustainable way. So just keep that thought for a minute because we're also talking about something else, about quickly engaging these quickly. Why does that need to be quick? Why is there any rush? We see the uh, household income is going to double until 2030. 2030 is all around the corner, so why rush? There might be a certain sense of urgency if you look at some activities and some of the moves of uh, players like Alibaba and WeChat, who have just applied for banking licenses in Hong Kong. And what's going to come after Hong Kong? Southeast Asia, most likely. So we have tech giants coming into financial services. They're in financial services already, so far with a focus on mainland China, but uh, they've also announced that they want to, through uh, under the umbrella of financial inclusion, go from in, in Alipay, so, or in Ant Financial's case, from 900 million to 2 billion users in the next couple of years. So if I'm a financial services player today, an existing player, or even if I'm a telco, a retailer or whatever, I've got these guys breathing down my neck. And they know no mercy and they know no delays. So they are coming. And the affluent, the emerging affluence, they're here already today. They might become a bit more wealthy and a bit more uh, affluent in the next 10 years, but they are already here today. So you need to engage them quickly. So how do you do that? Or how do you not do that? How have financial institutions 
developed new capabilities and particularly in the digital space in the past. That's how they did it. The jackhammer, the concrete, pouring concrete, hammering a hole in the floor to get down to the core banking system, to get down to the, into the entrails of their legacy. And that has a couple of problems. It's very expensive. Jack hammering through concrete floor and then replacing the floor once you want to close the hole. You're also doing stuff, you can't, that's very hard to change afterwards. So this is the traditional way of creating new capabilities, including digital wealth in banking. Not sustainable, particularly given the economics we're looking at. Is this a better way? Legal. And you all know the benefits of Lego, it all fits together very nicely, you can keep reconfigure it, you can use different colored stones, you can do all kinds of stuff. That is nice and we all like that. Analogy of Lego always sounds nice. Plug and play, the biggest lie in financial services. Never worked. Still, I think in the age, and you know the, you know the buzzwords, it's the open APIs, the restful APIs, the digital ecosystems, all the alphabet soup of digital finance, plug and play is becoming a little bit more tangible, a little bit more of a reality. Now, what does that mean in, in digital wealth? What am I talking about? There are pieces. There are pieces you need to do things like robotic advice, uh, dashboards, display financial products to people, show them the performance and stuff. These pieces are called for example, custody. Somebody needs to safe keep all the good stuff you buy. So they are custodians. I can buy that as a service. We buy this from our friends from Saxo Bank, just around the corner here. Uh, brokerage the same. It's also blue like Saxo Bank. We mainly, mainly use them for it. It's a piece, it's a service. It's uh, an, an ecosystem service you literally plug in. Customer profiling, risk profiling, a set of algorithms you can plug in or implement yourself. Advice asset management, the production and curation of financial products that you can actually buy of portfolios and of, of, um, of aggregations of financial products that are commensurate with your investment goals and your risk profile. You can buy them. We buy them from BlackRock. So there are Lego pieces available today by major, major players that you can assemble to do what? Actually, you don't even, I say, buy. You actually rent them, or in fact, you subscribe to them. That's the more important aspect. So as we're talking about the SaaS, the software as a service world, you don't pay for licenses, one-time license fees and stuff. You subscribe to them, like you subscribe to a mobile phone service. Very easy, get in, get out. No minimum commitment change them, flip them around, do whatever. So a Lego-based subscription service, this is where the, the Lego analogy probably stops because your Lego pieces you typically buy, you don't subscribe to them uh, because you might use them for a few years of your life. So what does that mean? Well, so what do you put together then? Put together, we said, an existing asset, an existing mobile asset, be it banks, be it uh, telcos, be it retailers, you add through either smart analytics or just a simple menu item, a, a digital wealth service such, a robo, such as a robo advisor, and then you use your Lego pieces in the back to power it. So that's what people call a digital ecosystem, but it's actually not some academic waffle. It is a real digital ecosystem that exists today that you can plug in and it can help you mobilize your financial service, your digital financial service, your digital wealth management service, very, very quickly and economically sustainable. If we unpack that for a second, what's behind it, let's look at the robo-advisor. I mean, simply speaking, these are three parts. One is a landing page where you have a dialogue about the investment goals of your customer. One's a an onboarding page where you try to understand the risk appetite and the sophistication of your customer. And then once uh, they have 
made the investment, have made the funding, you offer your customers a cockpit so that they actually see what's happening with their investment, what might happen in the future, and what would have happened in a financial crisis. So it's very, very simple, three, three parts. This is sort of the main parts of addi additives robot, uh, at least a sort of generation two, generation two and a half robot. So that's what unfolds underneath that. In the case of our robot, you actually, you can take it out of the box. It's, it's got six default design themes to choose from. So uh, if you're not too choosy, you might actually be quite happy with one of them. So even the user interface, it is configurable. You can white label it, you can re recolor it, you can redecorate it, you can put your, your, your logo on, but it comes out of the box. Even that, it's plug and play, legal. It's very important. So, and now I'm about to rest my case, just recapping the points I've been trying to convey. First one is emerging affluence in Southeast Asia, but also in other parts of the world, pose a major, major opportunity for digital wealth, for mobile digital wealth services today. But it needs to be engaging. Many companies exist already that have the mobile assets and the eyeballs out there. This is not about startups. This is not about B2C robots. This is about incumbents owning eyeballs. Very important. However, what they need to do is augment the functionality they have today with digital wealth management quickly. And by doing that in a legal approach, they can do it sustainably. Last point, the component tree exists. This is nothing that needs to be developed from scratch. There's enough players focusing on these ecosystem services. It's relatively easy to assemble them. I don't say it's easy. Nothing in IT and in financial services IT is really easy, but relatively compared to what it was like five years ago. Okay? And the last point is you subscribe to them very little commitment. So this is the call to action, this is the opportunity, and this is what Additive does, basically, for a living. Thank you very much for your attention. I think that was very quick. We have a few, we have a few minutes for questions.